I am an odd representative of talking about local food. In a moment of desperation, when I was at Stanford, um, I took a job uh, promoting Twinkies in the local supermarket. <laughs> and I had to dress up like a giant Twinkie. So I had to put on yellow tights and a yellow shirt and walk up and down the aisles and say, do you know that Twinkies are now individually wrapped for freshness? And I kind of look something like that. So the fact that I can be talking to you about local food means that any of you can talk about local food. Where I want to start is point out that there have been probably a hundred studies done over the last 10 years that show the incredible job potential of promoting local food. This is a study that I did in the greater Cleveland area about three years ago with two other colleagues. And we showed that a 25% shift in local food consumption in the greater Cleveland area would create 27,000 new jobs, about a billion dollars in new wages, and $126 million in new government tax collections. This would be enough in principle to re-employ one in seven unemployed workers in the greater Cleveland area. And this is just localization, modest localization in one particular sector, food. Now some of you may think that when you see a, we sell local food insignia at say the local Walmart, this is part of the job creation. But in fact, local has two meanings. One meaning is proximity, being close to the farmer. That's good for a number of reasons, but that's not where the economic benefits come from. The economic benefits come from the local ownership of each and every piece of the chain from the farm to the consumer. And that is why local businesses, local food businesses, every single link of the food chain is really important. We also showed in the Cleveland study that local food has a tremendous impact on things that are harder to put economic numbers around, like public health. The Cleveland Health Clinic, which is one of the premier public health institutions in the United States, now makes local food one of its priorities. It recognizes that local food, especially going into food deserts, which a lot of Metro Cleveland is, is a great way of replacing processed and junk food with healthy, fresh, tasty local food, and it's a great way of fighting the epidemic levels of type 2 diabetes and obesity, especially in children. We know that local food is good for the environment. We could see that the spread of urban farming was a way of dealing with various kinds of uh, urban, urban messes. Uh, it was a way of you know, converting, say, a junk piece of land into an urban farm is good for water quality, it is good for air quality, it is good for getting rid of rats and other insect vectors. Uh, it is good for controlling the climate. We also know that the spread of local farms in the region is commensurate with good stewardship. At the, at the end of the day, the most important land stewards that we have are farmers. We also know that local food brings down the carbon footprint because the less distance that food travels, the less energy that's consumed, and the less carbon that's emitted. And local food has a tremendous impact on global image. Cleveland, for many years, had the image of the city whose river caught fire. In fact, there was a folk song written about it called Burn On Cuyahoga. And what local food has done in Cleveland, and they've been, you know, there's incredible things happening in Cleveland with local food. It has changed the image into someone like Iron Chef Michael Simons. And, and 
This, of course, is great not just in the public image of the city, but also in the economic development of the city. More people, more companies want to locate there. We found in our study, as many of the other studies have done, that there are some big challenges with local food. And I, I just want to name them quickly. There's the challenge of land. It is extremely difficult to grow all or most of your food in an urban area because of limits of land. Consumer demand. How do you convince more people to buy more local food more of the time? Entrepreneurship. How do we train a new generation of farmers and local food enterprise leaders? Competitiveness. How do we make sure that local food businesses are as competitive as the big businesses that they are mobilized against? And finally, capital. How do we make sure there is the right amount of capital in the hands of these new or expanding farms and local food businesses? So I want to suggest that all of these problems actually can be overcome, and we know a lot right now about how to overcome them. What about land? Well, honestly, we have barely scratched the surface, literally, of where you can grow food. You go to cities like Toronto and you see the entire rooftops of this city growing food right now. We see the beginnings of technologies for growing food on the sides of buildings. We barely use the land on the sides of highways and other fields. I mean, do you even have an inventory of the kind of land that is in, available in this you know, relatively sprawling area that could be used for local food production? But that's just part of the solution. Any limit of land can be solved by thinking regionally. So the more that you think in a multi-county arrangement, the more likely it is you will be able to grow a substantial amount of your own food. There's also the issue of how the existing farmland is used. Most of your existing farmland is used for export. If some of that were converted to local consumption, the land problem could be solved. There's also a diet issue. The more that people shift from a very meat-intensive diet into a somewhat less meat-intensive, mixed diet, that also brings down the land requirements for local food. Consumer demand. You may have noticed that everywhere in the country there is a movement now promoting buy local. Uh, I go around the country and speak all the time. I speak in rural and urban areas, red states and blue states. Every single city I come into, there is a sign that says, you know, farmer's market, local bank, local food restaurant. There is no place I've ever gone to that says, we are not local, buy from us. <laughs> that shows how far we have come with this movement. The next stage of this movement is clever business designs, and I'm going to talk about this later today but clever business designs that allow us to promote these objectives in a self-financing kind of way. So I'll give you two examples. Supportland is a privately run local loyalty card in Portland. 50,000 Portland residents carry this card. Every time they use the card at a local business, they get points that they accumulate for discounts at other businesses. Bernal Bucks is a local debit card issued by a local credit union in Bernal Heights, San Francisco. They have allocated most of the fee associated with the card to the local business group to promote local purchasing. So, you know, very clever ways one can begin to push consumers to buy more local more of the time. Entrepreneurship. We've got a whole mess of really great entrepreneurship programs in the country, courses, mentorship programs, incubators, kitchen-oriented incubators, the emergence of farm schools, 
We know how to do this. This is not a big issue. Competitiveness. This is a big issue. How do we render local businesses more competitive? And one argument that I would make is actually local businesses are far more competitive than you think. If it were the case that local businesses were becoming less competitive in the last 10, 15 years, we would have seen jobs move out of the local business sector and into the large non-local business sector. And in fact, this is the record in the United States. The black stripe is home-based businesses. The white stripe underneath there is businesses with under 100 employees. And this is a percentage breakdown of jobs in the US economy. The blue stripe is technically small businesses, 100 to 500 employees. Those first three stripes are 99.9% .9 locally owned. The only non-local businesses are in that bottom stripe of 500 employees and, uh, uh, and above. Note there's been almost no change whatsoever. Almost no change whatsoever. Which shows that a lot of what people talk about with globalization is pure hype. Local businesses have remained remarkably competitive during this period. You can even see this with the profit rates. The most recent data released from US statistics show that the profit rates of sole proprietorships, which most small local businesses either are or start out as, are seven times greater than the profit rates of C corporations, which most larger businesses are. And you can see this even more clearly in recent data from Canada, uh, which isn't, its economy is not all that different than our own. And what it shows is that the profit rates of 10 to 20 employee businesses are the highest profit rates in the economy. Uh, the lowest profit rates, by the way, are the largest businesses that are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Go figure. When you talk specifically about local food businesses, what you're seeing is a bunch of fascinating new techniques that people are using in order to help local businesses improve their competitiveness still further. So in the introduction of me, it was mentioned that uh, I led a study done by the Gates and Kellogg Foundations that looked at 24 great local food businesses all around the world. This study, by the way, you can download at communityfoodenterprise.org. And the uh, cover looks like that. It, so I, think, I think it reveals dozens of different techniques that local businesses are using to be more competitive. I just want to share four of them with you. One is collaboration. There is no economy of scale that a local food business can't reach if it collaborates with other local food businesses, or in this case, farmers. Uh, this is a picture from Indian Springs Co-op in rural Mississippi. It's three dozen African-American farmers who've been working together since the days of the Civil Rights Movement. They collectively have built their own food hub to gather, clean, process, distribute food worth about a half million dollars. And because of their collaboration, they've been able to stay in business. Because of their collaboration, they have been able to move about five to $10,000 of business into six of the poorest rural counties in the United States, in Mississippi. Number two, quality. We know that local businesses generate fresher food, tastier food. That's why we love it. A guy who embodies this is Andrew Akuenze, a Canadian Native American. Um, Andrew has his own fishing business. Uh, he smokes his own fish. He brings it to farmers markets. His fish is so good it's celebrated by Slow Food International, their chef's movement. He says, by the time my competitors are getting the bone out of fish, my customers are eating my fish smoked. And 
This is how he is able to maintain his competitive advantage. And indeed, most local food embraces this. Number three, distribution. This is a picture from the Oklahoma Food Cooperative. Now, there are probably, I don't know, several hundred food hubs in the United States that do various kinds of distribution. This one is very interesting because it is organized as a co-op. It's been around for about 10 years. They've done $6 million of delivery to date. And their design is that once a month, there is an exquisite ballet that takes about 4,000 products from 90 different food providers, some farmers, some food manufacturers, and delivers them to 52 pickup sites in the state. This design has greatly brought down the cost of food distribution. And I want to pause for a second and point out that even when global businesses, global food businesses, are highly competitive on the production front, they are highly inefficient when it comes to distribution. So this graph here roughly shows what has happened to a dollar spent on food at a local market. And back in the year 1900, about 40 cents of the dollar was spent on the farmer. And the rest went to inputs and distribution. And by distribution, I mean everything from packaging, transportation, insurance, if you throw in processing would be there as well, uh, refrigeration, marketing, retail markup, and so forth. Today, so if I extend this out a little bit further, about seven cents goes to the farmer. And more than 70 cents goes to distribution. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that whenever you have a situation like this, even if you have really expensive production, say instead of seven cents, it's 14 cents, if you can get rid of most of that 70 cents of garbage and distribution, you have cheaper food and more income coming into farmers. And guess what? The Oklahoma Food Co-op achieves 18 cents per dollar on distribution. Speed. Lorenz Meats in Cannon Falls, Minnesota is a good example of the way that a local small business can be speedy can deliver a product just in time without needless storage, inventory, overhead. It has a small-scale, multi-species processing plant. They process uh, beef, elk, bison, um, I guess the occasional moose that strays in there. Uh, they don't do chickens. but. They've gotten a USDA license, and they teach other communities how to set up these sort of mid-scale meat processing plants, and this is how they are competitive. Let's talk briefly about capital. One of the conclusions that we had in the Cleveland study was that to achieve the 25% shift, you would need roughly three quarters of a billion dollars of new capital. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but it turns out that three quarters of a billion dollars is 1% of the total amount Clevelanders had in their savings accounts in banks. And three quarters of a billion dollars was one quarter of 1% of what Clevelanders had invested in their pension accounts. So a shift of even a tiny amount of money from our existing patterns of either saving in banks or saving through our pension funds can make a huge difference in unlocking this job's potential from local food. I want to give you some examples of this. In my most recent book, Local Dollars, Local Cents, I have about 100 examples like these. I do all-day workshops to teach people about these. I just want to share five now, and those of you who are around tonight, I'll share some more. First one is specialty CDs. We have examples <clears throat> of people who go to their local bank or credit union and say, we want more lending to local food enterprises. 
we don't want you to put your capital at risk, we'll put our capital at risk. We'll create for you at the bank a specialized certificate of deposit, uh, and then we will tell you who should get the loans. And if it does well, great, you get your administrative fees. If the money gets lost, we have it fully collateralized, and you get your administrative fees. Banks usually think this is a cool idea. So this picture here is from Equal Exchange, fair trade coffee organization company uh, in Boston. They approached their local bank, started as Eastern, uh, as Wainwright recently um, became uh, Eastern Bank, and, and they created a specialized CD to support fair trade coffee. The result is that Equal Exchange now has a $1 million line of credit at the local bank. Why don't you folks start to approach your local banks to create special local food CDs and then encourage people to put money on deposit there? Co-ops. Co-ops has been one of the institutions where we've seen a lot of local investment. Um, this is Weaver Street Market, Carborough, North Carolina, has 13,000 members. When they wanted to build a third store, they needed a million dollars. They wanted to borrow it from their members, and they agreed to pay their members 6-7% per year for the privilege of borrowing their members. And the payments, the interest payments, were so much greater than what banks were offering, members instantly took this up. And so I would think about, you know, how does one approach our co-op in doing various kinds of local investments to expand the local food infrastructure? LION. LION stands for the Local Investment Opportunities Network of Port Townsend, Washington. This guy, James Fraser, had been a successful hedge fund manager in New York, got very wealthy, felt a little guilty about it, came back to Port Townsend to do an interesting innovation. And it turns out that under securities laws, even after you've put you know, $50,000, $100,000 into securities work, you still may only be able to sell your securities, your stock or your, your debt notes, to investors with whom you have a pre-existing relationship. So what Fraser has done in Port Townsend is very smart. He has a monthly party, invites local businesses, local investors, mostly food businesses. He plies them with free food and alcohol, and at the end of each evening, he um, has a checkoff list with whom do you now have a pre-existing relationship. And so when he gets a business plan, he knows exactly who he can share that with. Just this one little social invention has brought $1 million per year in local investing into, um, the, into local businesses, primarily local food businesses, since 2008. That is, right in the midst of the financial crisis, a million dollars a year, a 10,000 person community. What would this do in a 300 plus thousand person county uh, like you live in? I think you can do the math. Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a donation crowdfunding site, Indiegogo, and there's a hundred other kind of local knockoffs like this. Here's, here's their offering for Brickside Brewery, Copper Harbor, Michigan's first microbrewery. If you give them a dollar, you get a thank you note. If you give them $25, you get a t-shirt. If you give them $1,000, you get the beer named after you. The thank you note, the t-shirt, the beer. These things from the Securities and Exchange Commission standpoint are not considered valuable returns on your investment. So this is a total and legal dodge of securities laws. <laughs> now, economists and business people would say, who the heck would give money for a t-shirt? And the answer is, last year on Kickstarter, half a billion dollars worth of people. And that's not counting the rest of the sites out there. So this kind of option for expanding your business without lawyers is available. Investment clubs. 
We have lots of examples, primarily linked with the organization Slow Money, of groups of civilians who come together, pool money, and then start investing together. And the key thing is, you can't have an investment advisor. You have to all do it kind of at an equal grassroots level. But this is an example of an investment club in Maine called No Small Potatoes. Every one of the 20 members kicks in $5,000 and collectively they vet farmers and food businesses for lending their money. As I said, we'll talk more about these later. Where I want to leave you this morning, though, is the same place where I end my book, Local Dollars, Local Cents, which is with a children's book called A Blue So Blue by Jean-Francois Dumont. And the book is about a boy who is obsessed with painting the color blue. Everywhere he goes, goes he paints blue. But there's one shade of blue that kind of comes to him in his sleep that mesmerizes him. And he, he can't figure out where the shade of blue comes from. So he goes on an international journey. He goes to the Louvre to find that color of blue, not there. He goes to look at various patches of water. No, the blue is not there either. He goes to a blues bar in New Orleans. Nope, not there. Then he meets a blue hooded stranger in the desert. And the stranger says, what you've been looking for may never have been very far away. And it dawns on the boy. The blue that he was looking for, that came to his sleep, that had totally mesmerized him, that he had you know, traveled so far to find, was actually the blue in his mother's eyes. And I feel like we so often forget that the wealth that we are trying to obtain, the financial wealth, the jobs, cannot be achieved through some far-fetched, exorbitant, attract and retain mega deal. It comes right in our own backyard, and if we start with food, we will get it right. Thank you very much.